Thank you for joining us for the continuation of uh, our conference. Uh, uh, this is the panel two of day two, critical approaches. Uh, so this is the Barry L Lawrence Ruderman conference, uh, co-sponsored together with the Rumsey Map Center. We're very generous. Uh, we're very grateful to the general support um, that we received to be able to do this. And of course, we're so so excited that so many people. I have kept on, uh, you know, engaged and 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 you know, in in many ways, learning all together. Uh, it's such fascinating uh, couple of days uh, and and one more to come. Uh, so I'm Alberto Diaz Calleros. I'm uh, a senior fellow at the Center for Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law at Stanford University, and I'm also the director of the Center for Latin American Studies. Uh, I do apologize beforehand that I hope I can pronounce names correctly. Um, there is, uh, I think, a, a strong sense of continuity in the discussions that we will have in, in this panel, but this panel actually happens to not be of uh, Latin American content, uh, which was the case in the previous panels. Um, but I think this is one of the richness of the whole uh, process that we are uh, learning uh, together. Uh, I will introduce our three speakers, then they will each have 25, 30 minutes uh, to do their presentations, and then we'll open up to Q&A. Uh, please do remember we are using the Q&A box uh, so that I can uh, you know, field the, the questions and hopefully uh, we'll be able to cover uh, most of them or all of them in, in that part of the session. Uh, so today we, we have uh, Nachi Blue Barnd, who is an associate professor at Oregon State University. He teaches, uh, he researches comparative and critical ethnic studies, uh, and particularly he's focused on the intersections of ethnic studies, cultural geography, and indigenous studies. He has a recent book, uh, Native Space, Geographic Strategies to Unsettle Settler Colonialism, uh, uh, in which he illustrates the ways in which native people in North America sustain and create indigenous geographies in settler colonial nations. And he's working, finishing another book that I think he's gonna share with us some of the things he's doing uh, in that one. Uh, Laura Harjo, she is a Mvskok, Mvskok scholar, award-winning author and associate professor in Native American studies and affiliated faculty in the regional and city planning program at the University of Oklahoma. Harjo's research and teaching centers on three areas, spatial storytelling, anti-violence and indigenous architecture and planning, and community-based knowledge production. Uh, her book, uh, Spiral of, to the Stars, Mufskok Tools of Futurity, uh, published by University of Arizona Press, employs uh, Mufskok epistemologies and uh, indigenous feminisms to offer a community-based practice of futurity. And finally, our third speaker will be Candace Fujikane. She is a professor of English at the University of Hawaii. She has co-edited with uh, Jonathan Okamura, Asian Settler Colonialism, from local governance to the habits of everyday life in Hawaii. Uh, and she recently published a monograph, uh, the title is Mapping Abundance for a Planetary Future, uh, Kanaka Maoli and Critical Settler Geo Cartographies in Hawaii, uh, which I think she's also going to tell us a little bit about that project. So thank you so much, everyone. And uh, let's then get started uh, with uh, Nachi, uh, if we can start with you. Uh, well, thank you for the invitation, the introduction. Um, I'm actually not going to be speaking about the new book project. Um, this is a, an emerging project, which I'll describe a little bit here. Um, so I've tentatively titled this Indigenous Installations, Columbia River Art as Cultural Cartography. And I'm just going to kind of hit it hard right in the beginning here and, and go right into some of those um, installations. And then I'm gonna backtrack a bit and provide a little bit of context for how this came about and what's I, what I see happening here uh, before coming back around to the installation. So just so you have a sense of the, the pathway that I'm gonna be taking here. Um, so let me start with the first image. So I'm gonna begin with this piece, this installation art piece called The Man from Kashuk Shiks. Um, which is a piece which recalls a village site that once um, existed near the location where this piece is, is, has been installed, uh, which is on the uh, George Rogers Park in Lake Oswego, which is, which is just 
upriver from uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, and this piece uh, recalls a story about that village and the, and I won't tell the whole story because it's not my story, but I will share just the parts that I can share here. Um, and this tells the story of a head person who was trying to convince a couple villages of the value of uh, and how to harvest lamprey from the nearby Willamette Falls, which is a traditional gathering site or it became a traditional gathering site and is an, a very ancient fish. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. And this, but this, uh, this piece is to re recall that story and to remind folks of the, the importance of following those stories, uh, those sort of ecological lessons, because those who didn't follow his advice died and those who did survived and then went on to um, create the descendants who are still with us today. So let me just show you the next pieces here, sorry. Switching screens. Um, this is a picture of Willamette Falls, uh, which is also a, an, an indigenous word um, for the river here. This is the river he was referring to. Um, this is a picture of a young boy, um, I guess maybe a century back, uh, with a few of the lamprey that he's obviously either been part of or captured himself. Um, and probably also really important is the timeline of lamprey that I want to just add to the story because I'm trying to convey why this particular location and why this installation is, is especially important and meaningful. Um, this is a timeline for lamprey. For those who don't know about the Pacific lamprey, who were, oh, sorry, it shifted on me, were hunted to near extin extinction just in a very short time once the uh, European settlers arrived. But if you look at the, for some reason, the timing keeps moving on me. Um, if you look at the timeline, they are 450 million years old, which is double the amount of time of the dinosaurs. So we are talking a very ancient species that was nearly wiped out in a very, very short time. Um, when they gathered, they gathered abundantly as this one from just over a century ago um, illustrates with the lamprey as they make their way proceeding up the rocks and up and over the falls. Um, with their mouths, using their mouths um, to, to climb. So thinking about that context versus near extinction. Um, and this again, coming back to the sculpture, and I'll show this one more time at the end as a sort of representation of these cartographies being sort of indicated by uh, the art installation pieces. So. Now to the context. I, I wanna start by indicating that this work was given to me and to say a little bit how what, and why. I think this is an important distinction for a number of reasons, some of which I'll explain here, um, but I'm a comparative and, uh, and interdisciplinary ethnic studies scholar who works at the intersections of race, geography, and indigenous studies, as was said in my introduction. And I focus a lot of my research on indigenous geographies. Uh, a few years ago, I participated in local non-university centered speaking series organized by the local Sierra Club, um, but hosted by the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz. The series focused on sharing aspects about the Kalapuya peoples, those whose descendants are now members of those host nations, and specifically about the Ampinafu band who belonged and belonged to the lands where my university in town is currently situated in, in Corvallis, Oregon. One of the other presenters from that series um, is the director of the Grand Ron Cultural Resources Unit and a colleague that I've worked with on many occasions over the last nine years as part of my teaching and research. Um, after my talk about a variety of everyday indigenous practices of creating, sustaining, and expanding native geographies, including art through art and through public installation art specifically, my colleague approached and asked if I'd be interested in helping them consider how they might be more conscientious and strategic in their ongoing efforts to produce installation works across the region, including in the urban spaces of the city of Portland. Um, and this is part of a larger effort that we can maybe talk about later um, to build just relations across the region. So a few weeks later, my colleague organized the tour of the existing works that had already been installed, um, hosted by many of the artists, and intended, attended by uh, a number of local st stakeholders and institutions. So I was the only academic there, but uh, there were representatives from the Regional Arts and Cultural Council, from Nike, 
um, the shoe company, <laughs> the Portland Art Museum, the Oregon Humanities Organization, and TriMet, uh, who frequently commissions public art for their various regional transportation infrastructure projects. Uh, so, and because of that, I've at this point, I've conducted several interviews and I've had many informal discussions with artists and tribal community members. Um, the result has been an emerging effort at documentation about clarity uh, of, of artist intentions and also about some early planning for an interactive mapping of these sites um, where we're gonna use the art form uh, that I'm gonna discuss as the organizing scale. So first, uh, some crucial context about the art that I wanna share with you all. Columbia River, uh, Columbia River art is a shared aesthetic style used across the native nations of the lower Columbia River. Um, and I have here on the map, uh, just sort of a big picture of the, what we consider the Northwest coast, uh, I think through anthropological categories at least. And then a zoomed in on that red box, the zoomed in on the right side um, of the Oregon um, slash Washington area that we're looking at. Uh, despite falling within the anthropological culture area that designates it as part of the Pacific Northwest, uh, the art style of the Columbia River is distinct from that of the, of, uh, the most commonly known Pacific Northwest style. And I should uh, sh just mention really quickly here, this is a map of, oh my gosh, it keeps moving on me. Um, this is a picture of the Columbia River, which goes up from the Pacific coast and then up northward, northward through British Columbia and splits off, as you can see, heading west or east with the uh, Snake River. But right around that point at you where the Umatilla um, live and where the river splits between the Snake and the, and the northern branch of the upper, um, upper branch of the, uh, the Columbia, that's everything from that to the coast is considered the lower Columbia River. And that's the, um, and that's the sort of region that we're talking about where this particular cultural practice and aesthetic um, derives from. So one of the most significant important tensions emerging from the interviews is precisely where race, culture, and geographies intersect. Many of the Columbia River artists ex have expressed a difficulty in their labor beyond the artistic, the artistic work or the navigation of the usual gatekeepers and institutions, all of which are already uh, substantial. In addition to those, they are confronted with the work of, uh, with the work or re-education, um, a political navigation of urban indigeneity, and they must become defenders and promoters of authenticity because their work is not considered Pacific Northwest so that nobody knows what it is, nobody knows how to place it, it gets subsumed. So they're ultimately forced to confront both settler colonial and multicultural cartographies. For many indigenous communities, art has been one of the few cultural practices which found a relatively consistent outlet in the settler colonial context. Even as assimilation campaigns targeted other aspects of life, commercial and market opportunities sometimes provided a means for incorporation into capitalist economies, while sustaining traditional practices. So basket, maybe, basket making and carving, for example, sometimes provided additional economic um, survival techniques. Uh, while only a few, a select few seem to have been able to sustain these practices as a career, um, they did allow for some degree of continuation for a handful of master artisans who were then tapped in recent decades for their skills and knowledge. And I'll just show you a last uh, example here of some of these uh, Columbia River art um, techniques. Columbia River art, however, outside of some of the basketry was apparently never generally suited for the non-native market. While certain forms of indigenous art became a major force um, and in many ways a defining aesthetic in the Pacific Northwest, that art has origins that emerged from the north of the Columbia River. So think uh, of Seattle's adoptions and appropriations like you see here, with things like the totems, so what most understood or understand as Pacific Northwest art is actually Northern Pacific Northwest art. Uh, one of the most noted facilitators of the Pacific Northwest art proliferation was Bill Holm, a non-native artist and professor who generated interest starting in the 1960s in art among both the non-native market and among indigenous artists or aspiring artists. 
While home has been instrumental in invigorating many artistic traditions of the Pacific Northwest, his influence has also unintentionally overridden some of the differences of the region. And I'm just gonna show you the book cover here. Uh, on the 50th anniversary and retrospective of the publication of his widely utilized book, Northwest Coast Indian Art and Anal Analysis of Form, he was explicit about his tendency towards uh, uh, excuse me, he was explicit about this tendency, not his, but this tendency toward conflations. When asked by the UW Press or University of Washington Press about his key reflections, he pointed to two issues of uh, pause. First, he addressed the use and intentions of his book. He says, quote, as I look back on five decades of this book, there really isn't much that it would change today. I suppose if I had guessed that it would become a kind of handbook for Northwest Coast artists, native, art, native artists, rather than a somewhat technical analysis of the characteristics of their art, I might have written it differently. The only other point of pause that he offers was the acknowledgement that his work may have inadvertently overwhelmed sub-regional art forms and how he might have been more forceful about specificity, re reiterating the emphasis on Northern. So he says, quote, probably the first thing I would have changed would be the title and adding the word Northern before Northwest Coast. In effect, northern northwest coast Indian art. <laughs> Although the, ge the, the geographical limits of the tradition are stated a number of times in the text, he says, artists and others um, using it have often skipped the words in favor of the pictures. The result has been that many have assumed that the art tradition described was pan coastal. One of the faulty or perhaps most effective techniques of inclusion in multicultural settler colonial uh, nation states is the act of misrecognition. So in Portland, as with many other places um, like Seattle, when indigenous recognitions are entertained and it is often as much about entertainment as, uh, as the means of incorporation, um, indigeneity is frequently de destabilized by acts of confusing or conflating peoples. Um, and I mean this in, a more in more complicated ways than just simple abstraction or generic racialization or other acts of making others in this, in this particular case. So in Portland, the descendants of the Lower Columbia Rivers um, must confront erasures by the already regional category of Pacific uh, Northwest Indian, which is typically the most differentiation Native peoples can expect outside of a few you know, uh, examples here and there. Uh, the relative authenticity of the broader Pacific Northwest art forms, especially when expressed via its commercialization and recognition as a mode of differentiation from other indigenous art forms still leaves very little room for Columbia River art. And so here there's this just really brief example and I don't wanna like smash on this guy too much, but a Clinkett artist who um, installed this uh, piece representing a Clinkett dancing staff at a new apartment building in um, on 11th Street in, um, in, uh, in downtown Portland. And this is something that a lot of folks had issues with because of that uh, that creep, that creep of that particular style down into these territories and that sort of reiteration basically of the fact that the, the Columbia River art is not recognized and is not seen as local or indigenous to this territory. And so they were, they were a little bit upset by the fact that the artist did it and some even said, you know, he knew better than to, to do that here. Um, but we won't get into all those things just yet. Um, so perhaps the upside is that the Northern, uh, the Northern Pacific Northwest style has not actually been thoroughly appropriated in places like Portland, other than a few examples like this one, which leaves open a sort of void that the artist of the Columbia River can potentially now fill. And there's a few places where this is happening. And those are some of the things that I'll be sharing with you here. And the timing may also prove beneficial uh, when, when these sort of art appropriations took place. So when other styles of art were being commodified and appropriated, tribal sovereignty was highly compromised and gaming revenues here have not generated um, the kinds of economic and polit political force that they have more recently. This is especially true for places like Grand Rom. Um, the effort to begin a thoughtful public art installation movement now come with increased layers of intentionality and self-determination. So there's a moment that is different than just sort of the sometimes desperation that folks were faced with when they were deciding about how and when to sort of share or sell their art in different ways. 
<clears throat> so it's perhaps appropriate that the larger sphere of Columbia River art resurgence may have um, also been in initiated by the canoe. One of the unexpected observations I heard during my interviews with artists was that the contemporary vi revitalization of Columbia River art can be traced back to the beginning of what's known as the canoe journey. And this is an image from the, the very first of the canoe journeys, the Paddle to Seattle, uh, which was uh, an effort at research, uh, revitalizing canoe uh, making and, and uh, navigating techniques and a number of other things. Um, which I'll get into. Um, so Greg Robinson, a Chinook carver, for example, told me that the canoe journey was probably the key impetus for increased Columbia River art interest and participation. And uh, several art other artists have, um, have echoed that um, statement. So the canoe journey is a recent culturally inspired activity and gathering that promotes traditional technologies, cultural practices, so regalia, song, language, architecture, intertribal protocol, and according to at least two of my interviewees, artistry more generally. Um, it began in 1989, as I mentioned, when this family's canoe families were paddled out to sea and then returned to Seattle to gather a message, uh, to gather and deliver a message to the people of the state of Washington about their obligations to the non-human world and to reiterate tribal sovereignty. And as Edgar Heap of Birds, as a uh, Cheyenne Arapaho uh, installation artist might say, it was their reminder, it was a reminder from native hosts to their non-native guests. The journey um, that beginning began in 1989 has grown to an, an annual event um, now with host nations welcoming more, welcoming more than a hundred canoes at a time and up to 12,000 people. So briefly touching back on the uh, man from Kashuk Shiks, oops. Uh, here you see the overlap of the canoe journey, the carving art and sculpture as it returns, as well as acts of indigenous spatiality as they're placing their, the installation at that site um, along the Willamette. The decision to host the canoe journey or participate in it places a great deal of pressure, largely welcomed, I think, to expand, to extend, and to deepen cultural practices. So participants find themselves wanting to improve their ability to give speeches in their traditional languages, for example, especially since the protocols of welcome and being welcome are, are can be quite formal and structured. Um, it also offers a way to travel, uh, sorry, it also offers a way uh, to travel and recreate the shared indigenous maps of these lands and to recreate some new ones or to create some new ones. Participating people want to increase the number of those capable of producing and wearing the necessary regalia. They want to seek the ex to expand the size of their canoes or fleets improve their collective navigation skills. Dancers and singers become critical when they formally present themselves for especially requesting passage and going and, and then coming ashore. And as, the, as these communities gift one another during these, these gatherings, they wish to produce and be able to offer well-crafted and traditional offerings. And so this one act becomes a sort of springboard, a springboard for so many more activities. The canoe journey is also a perfect metaphor for considering the tensions of race, space, and culture. As a technology of navigation, its fluid movement also recovers and strengthens our indigenous cartographies, both those that are tribally specific and those that are shared spaces. The canoe journeys are an amazing example of the production of new forms of old geographies. So space and thus map to require constant maintenance and production, and these artistic acts of indigenous mobility decenter tribal containment. They sustain traditional relationships to the world and pull those geographies out from under the heavy blanket of settler colonial space. Thus, the canoe can be modeled for enacting indigenous space by navigating and engaging across nations, by carving cedar, by singing and dancing, all reasserting the relationships needed to practice indigenous science and technologies and rooted in longstanding cultural cartographies. So as I start toward wrapping up, not quite there yet, but um, I wanted to look at, at a couple of uh, pieces that have been installed and sort of talk about how they see them in tension and in confluence with their intentions um, with this project. And this is a piece by uh, Tony Johnson as Chinook and Adam McIsaac, who is a non-native carver, which we can talk about him and other that role uh, um, at a, a later time, hopefully. 
Um, so these bunk rails are in what's technically a public plaza, but is uh, somewhat restricted or a false public space because it's located on the rooftop of a building on the Portland State University campus. So while it may not be public installation in the expected definition of that term, it is at the very least strategically positioned, right? The, how, the building houses PSU's College of Urban and Public Affairs, which offers the artists and the tribes an uncommon and pointed announcement of indigenous presence in urban spaces and in those academic fields that rarely consider native people, native people in terms of their curriculum, their research programs, their student and faculty composition, or their otherwise relatively robust kind of community engaged practices. So here we see um, carvings by Johnson and McIsaac of the Ram and the Kingfisher, which is uh, a direct take, although a sort of an evolution of the model of bunk rails, which were traditionally interior features that lined the living spaces of, for families. Um, so in, in the intimate home, spaces of home, largely in their, in their, within their very large cedar plank houses. Um, but they're not traditionally, uh, I'm sorry, they are traditionally therefore public in a sense, public works and visible to others and not reserved for private or ceremonial function, which means they could be shown in this particular way as a public installation piece versus other pieces which are not intended in those ways. Um, so putting these contemporary versions on the public and urban studies bu building metaphorically extends the plank house, the traditional plank house, which usually housed multiple families and now extends it to all those families in the urban setting, um, not in a sort of blind acceptance, but in a sort of uh, way of uh, making a claim. While the home is extended, the domestic spatial claim remains firm. In a sense, they're saying, this is our house and here are our bunk rails. Uh, another set is collectively known as, quote unquote, we have always lived here, which is a pretty direct statement, I think, about um, presence in this territory, which is a small collection of pieces uh, that make a geographical statement on either side of a pedestrian, bicycle, and mass transit bridge over the important Willamette River. The bridge itself was also named based on the Grand Ronde suggestion called Tilikum. Um, Chinook Carver and sculptor Greg Robinson uh, indicates the work and its placement is about, quote, having a permanent testament to the survival and ongoing culture of the Chinookan people who still live here in the Portland metro area. So very clear statements about the intentions here. So like the canoe and the canoe journey, this bridge, which is a structure of mobility and movement, also offers an anchoring for those non-Indigenous peoples moving across the geography uh, of their ancestors. And uh, I just want to briefly say this is a term that some of us have kind of thrown around and been using, which offers non-Indigenous peoples a way to see and think and hopefully rethink appropriate connections between themselves, the lands they occupy, and the Indigenous peoples of the past, as well as obviously those here today. So the term ancestors, since they're not directly um, uh, connected to those people. And this becomes an important way that is not just looking backward in the past, um, but looking to the present and into the future. And we can, if we have time, we'll kind of come back around to this particular image here. So the, uh, the uh, artist Edgar Heberberts, whose work often makes explicit use of public installation art in order to provide what he calls insurgent messages, makes the case that such work can generate alternative discourse and discussion. His approach typically makes use of non-traditional forms of art um, in his effort to assert indigenous geographies and challenge settler colonial space in the center of its realms, especially urban spaces where uh, native people and stories are often deemed absent or irrelevant. So coming back around to the, the original image I showed, the artists currently producing Columbia River public art installation pieces are more narrowly inspired. They seek to also strengthen their carving and sculpting practices, even as they reposition claims over spaces now dominated by concrete and by non-Indigenous peoples. Thus, much of their work has the potential, or the dangerous potential, to be presumed as either examples of artistic but historic artifact, rather than contemporary products, which these all are, or as uh, culturally unique but otherwise just aesthetic supplements to a multicultural collection of public art. So the spatial concerns of these artists and the implicit spatial implications of their work cannot um, 
their work often cannot target conscious intervention. In other words, few of these, few viewers of these works will easily discern that they stand as markers of indigenous present and future, as well as ongoing claims to land, which are also partial rejections of settler colonial geographies. In the long term, however, I do think that the proliferation of this work will undoubtedly reach a kind of tipping point of recognition. Uh, the artists I work with and the cultural agents active for Grand Ronde, at least, uh, seem to understand these processes through a larger time scale. They have watched the long trajectory of not just this art form, but also the very recognition. So this is a tribe that was once terminated by the federal government and is now restored and prospering and maturing in relation to um, the complicated and, con and contradictory sort of neoliberal multicultural context. Almost done here. So this project uh, and is deeply and precisely situated by the tensions of race, space, and neoliberalism because the indigenous cultural practitioners and artists participate simultaneously and only partially consciously in the creation of a multicultural nation state and its narrative of inclusion, precisely as they push to assert, reacquire, and mark indigenous geographies via the same actions. And that is the end for me. Thanks for bearing with me. Appreciate it. I'm looking forward so to the next. Thank you. Thank you so much for also uh, not just sharing these beautiful images and the stories and uh, your own uh, accounts about them, but also this hopeful um, ending of your discussion, which I think is always something that is very, very welcome. Uh, so let's continue now, uh, if, if we may, just in the order of the of the program. So if uh, Laura, if you can continue. Thank you. Awesome. OK, uh, thank you all today. Piche Lara Harjo Chaha Chiskidos Tuskigi Amitowados Yaha Helgi Amaleidos Duke Harjo Takte Mom and Ellen Harjo Chachkol Getawagis. Hello, my name is Laura Harjo. I am Wolf Clan and I am from Tuskegee Tribal Town. My parents are the late Duke Harjo and Ellen Harjo. And I will begin now. So I'm focusing on today of thinking through um, some pieces from my book, uh, Muskogee Tools of Futurity. So I'm looking at spatializing our futurity and relationality, Muskogee Emergence Geographies. So what I wanna to do today is um, define futurity, spatialize futurity, and show how our local Muskogee and larger metro kind of urban area um, practices futurity. So I'll go ahead and begin. Okay, so first I want to define this idea of indigenous futurity. So future, a future temporality is not robust enough for the kind of community planning work that I work in. So it invokes past, present, and future. So with regard to the past, it's the unactivated possibilities of our ancestors. In terms of the present, it's living out the future that we wish for in a contemporary moment. And in terms of future, it's the creation of the conditions for our relatives in a future temporality. And the way that I come to this work, I was doing a sense of place workshop in a community, probably it's been like 15 years ago now. And I asked them where they saw their community in 100 years. And they said that they won't have anything, that there'll be rich people living in big houses on their land, they won't have their land, they won't have their language, they won't have anything. So then, this is where indigenous planning comes in, then how do you disrupt that imagined future and put the conditions in place right now for the kind of future that you wish for? Um, and then how do you live out a future that you wish for right now? Because often in indigenous community planning work, we sit with folks, we ask them to imagine 25 years into the future, 50 years into the future, seven generations into the future. And sometimes that becomes difficult to 
to sit and wait. We ask communities to sit and wait. So this idea of futurity then enables folks to live out the kind of future that they want right now. Um, and then indigenous futurity, it's also the enactment of theories and practices that activate our ancestors' unrealized possibilities. So Leanne Simpson in Pedagogy of the Land, she talks about theory and describes it as a way of understanding the world. So then this idea of Muscogee tools of futurity, they are grounded in Muscogee theories and practices. It's Muscogee practices theorized, et cetera. So how can these theories and practices activate our ancestors' unrealized possibilities? Um, it's also the act of living out the futures we wish for, right? So in terms of a um, Muscogee notion of that, it's this idea that we remain in conversation with our ancestors and that there is a continuity in cultural or spiritual values. So regardless of whether you receive recognition from the nation state as a sovereign, so we already know that the kind of sovereign that we exercise under, um, under the US regime that it's injured. But we know that in terms of this other kind of sovereignty that we enjoy within our community and we recognize between one another that's grounded in cultural and spiritual values, that that's something that we can practice regardless of who chooses to recognize our inherent sovereignty. So for Muskogee or Muskogee people, um, it's this idea also that we're remaining in conversation with our ancestors. That means that we're either answering to an elder or we're answering to ancestors. And this belief system allows us to have a type of kinship relationship with our values. Our values keep us in check the same way our relatives or ancestors keep us in check. It's also the idea that our lives are not bookended by birth and death, that we have a responsibility to our relatives that came before us and our relatives that will come after us. Um, in terms of like, if we think about missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, there's a way in which um, their lives were not lived in vain, that they keep us responsible as well. So next I will talk about a little bit about the four tools of Muskogee futurity. So these are three, or I mean, there are four methodologies that were theorized and really emerged from Muskogee practices. So, and I show this to you today because I'm going to focus on emergence geographies, but I want to give a larger context so that it's not just like I'm naming spaces, like there's like a larger context to this. So the first is the Jati sovereignty. That's really grounded in relationality. It's, um, there's a word that we have, it's anogechka, which means love. And it's this idea of um, serving or helping one another. So there's a collectiveness in this kind of um, sovereignty. There's another aspect of this that from um, a Muscogee belief system that all exchanges between entities are exchanges of energy. So whether whatever the quality of that energy is, you can sense it, you absorb it, you transfer it back and forth. And that's kind of what this, um, this figure here shows us. This is Mississippian iconography, but this is the ever flowing relationality within the community. Next is community knowledge. So we know that community knowledge can surface in myriad ways. Felt knowledge, um, knowledge through our senses in terms of smell, sight, hearing, soundscapes, etc. cetera. Um, collective power. So that can look like different kinds of um, coming together and creating something. It's not about authoritative power or oppositional power, but it's how does the 
how do communities come together to create something? And then emergence geographies, which I will talk more deeply about today, is um, so from a community planning perspective, the idea of nation state kind of delineated geographies they don't necessarily work for recognizing where our community um, exists, where it thrives, where it's animated, um, and even kind of the, I guess, Western ways of locating on XYZ coordinate systems that that doesn't necessarily always work for locating indigenous communities. So if you don't know how and where to locate indigenous communities, then you can't plan with and for indigenous communities. So that's sort of like the framework around indigenous or emergence geographies. So these four kind of concepts, these are uh, wayfinding tools for communities to find their way as a map to the next world. So that's also based on Joy Harjo's poem, Map to the Next World. So these serve as wayfinding tools and they can do their own community-based wayfinding work. So the way that I um, wrote and produced the scholarship was really about how can my own relatives pick up this work? You don't need an expert. You don't need to go to a university for X number of years to carry it out but that you can really um, enact some of the exercises I have at the very back of the book to invoke each of these sort of methodologies that I have here. So then that yields an indigenous futurity praxis. So I have several sets of theses for an indigenous futurity praxis, a few here, Futurity, refusing the not yet of planning work. It invokes many temporalities, past, present, future. And then radical or stajati sovereignty. It's about developing relationships with and in the community. It's about re <clears throat> reciprocity and community generated sovereignty. Community knowledge is about renegotiating time, feel, smell, dream and dialogue in terms of knowledge. Community power, this can be a collective felt knowledge, such as caretaking, like coming together and beating together as a way of caretaking, um, making medicine teas together as a way of caretaking, any of this sort of like teaching and learning and um, making, making with your hands together. And then alternative economies is also a form of caretaking. So maybe that's like somebody's grandmother is trading um, a pecan pie or some pecan pies for somebody to put a carburetor in her car. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about these alternative economies within the community. And then finally, again, emergence geography. So these are specialities that emerge from Muscogee relationality how we come together, how we organize our relationships, create specific spatialities. And it's more than a fixed space. So let's see. I'll copy there. So then if we focus on unactivated possibilities, um, this is one piece of futurity that I really feel um, a responsibility to. So if I think about the Trail of Tears and I know that um, some say that no babies survived Indian removal for Muscogee people. Um, and if there were, there were very few babies and there were very few elders that survived Indian removal to Oklahoma. So today we're in our treaty lands in Oklahoma. But this idea then of premature death, we had um, this wave of premature death during removal. We had um, the Allotment Act. We had boarding schools. We had termination. We had um, relocation. We have to grapple with all these determinants of um, health, 
so in general, the tribe grapples with this notion of premature death. And I write about this in a Where I Am From poem about my grandmothers not living to be called elders. So what then is my responsibility to them and their unactivated possibilities? And recently now with COVID and the pandemic, I think that folks outside of your, you know, BIPOC folks are finding what it really feels like to grapple with this idea of premature death and what the futurity of your household, your family, your community looks like. Next is spatializing futurity. So in terms of this, a spatial language that my community understands is needed and it needs to be grounded in their knowledge so that they can imagine and carry out a Muscogee or indigenous futurity. So a lot of the work that I'm doing, and I think it's just because I'm a geographer too, of this idea of spatializing concepts. So with this, then I'm gonna move forward talking about spatialities. So I begin from emergence geographies. At the beginning of creation, there was a great fog that obscured everything. It blocked the people from finding one another. Muscogee people emerge from the fog to find their kin and form groups. This is where our clans come from, and we trace our clans through our mother to this genealogy and this story of movement and creation. And since this, this time and this story, Muscogee people have continually been in movement. They've been mobile. They've continually had to reemerge. So we're originally in the southeastern United States um, and with encroachment of settlers, our tribal towns in Georgia were pushed into Alabama. Those towns had to reemerge in Alabama. Then with removal, there was an upheaval and a reemergence in Indian territory. And each sort of federal Indian policy aimed at erasure, there was always an upheaval and a reemergence. So with allotment and the parceling out of a collective land base for people to settle, settle down and become farmers, that too is kind of like you're moving people from one place to another. And in some cases, families were split up and living in different places across Creek Nation. But this idea that we have continued to emerge. And that's what I'll be talking about is how these emergences kind of show up. So kinship is carried out through many spatialities and relationality is an intergenerational and spatial journey. If we take a look at this first map of chartered communities. So Creek Nation has about 20 or so chartered communities. Those chartered communities, they like follow the rules and regulations of Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, many of them have brick and mortar buildings, and many of them are the site of Muscogee based activities. Even more are places where they have elderly nutrition programs carried out on a daily basis. So you have a space where um, our elders are coming together on a daily basis, at least five out of seven days a week, um, gathering and creating that social fabric. So this is more for context. So you can see if you're familiar with the US and Oklahoma, or, um, where Oklahoma is, you can see that here's the state of Oklahoma. And then this is a locator map of where Creek Nation is. So we have Cherokees to the east, Osage to the north, Choctaw and Chickasaw to the south, Seminoles to the west. This next one is actually on the cover of my book, and this is the work of Muscogee Potawatomi artist Daniel McCoy. The name of it is Chain of Being. So this is a map too. I consider this a map. So on the right side is this kind of Western-based hierarchical ordering of life. 
where you can see organisms and you can go all the way up to angels and the heavens and sort of like this uh, narrative of a visual narrative of Christianity and hierarchy coming through. On this left side, it could be construed as a Muscogee way of knowing the world. Um, it's not necessarily legible to non-Muscogee people. And you could spend your whole life figuring out and trying to understand that. So in this kind of way, I like how there's data sovereignty encoded into that left side that maybe you have to have some um, Muscogee teachings to fully understand what this left side is saying. And it's also a form of Audra Simpson's ethnographic refusal. So next I'll talk about kin space time. So I call them kin space time envelopes, but I'm not really happy with the envelope part. Like I'm not really sure yet if that's the right term. Because I draw from geography, but I really think like maybe bundle or like something that you carry something in, like a Muscogee word for that is more precise. But this is what I'm using for now. So kin space time gives primacy to kin. So often when we hear narratives about our communities, it's often grounded in necrochronologies. So these moments of death. Um, and we look back in our history. I just laid out this whole kind of federal, federal Indian policy timeline. Those were all pretty much necrochronology. So how can you start telling, um, telling stories of futurity, right? So if we're looking then at kin space time, kin space time can be maybe a memory, but it's not solely a recalling of a scene or vignette. It provides instruction or a sense of responsibility or res responsibility to many intersecting moments of relationality, spatiality, and temporality. So then kin space time, it gives primacy to kin, and it is the spatialities in which this kind of kinship relations or relationality happens. And the time piece is that you can have a kin space time moment that happened hundreds of years ago and you can be in conversation or dialogue with it right now. So an example of that is if we're looking at star constellations and there's a Muscogee story about a particular um, constellation, there's a couple and one is about a canoe constellation. We also see Orion's belt, but that I and the Milky Way and the idea of this celestial space that these same sort of celestial entities that I see on a summer night during maybe our green corn ceremony or during the stomp dance season, those are the same celestial entities that my relatives hundreds of years before me saw on a summer night during a green corn ceremony. And my relatives in the future, right now we have a pipeline of kids at our ceremonial grounds that they learn how to sing. It's an ongoing pipeline. They learn how to sing, they learn how to shake shells. So I know that at least we've got several generations coming after that will see those same celestial entities and remember their teachings around that, right? So that's kind of like, an understanding of that. Another kind of example would be like maybe seeing my mom at the stomp grounds with my aunts and their friends um, laughing. It's a hot summer night, it's humid, but they're fanning themselves off and laughing. And to me, that's a kin space time envelope as well because it's a teaching of how to be in good relations with um, my stomp dance relatives and how to be in good relations on a hot summer night where maybe somebody else would be complaining. Um, another kind of kin space time envelope is like, um, I think about my dad never really throwing indigenous community under the bus, right? Like you never saw him talk down or run down indigenous communities in front of other people, especially non-indigenous people. 
And it's that idea of, <clears throat> like I can think of different moments around that that would be Ken Space time envelopes and his way of refusing a damage-centered narrative about indigenous community. So if we turn to the work of Hadogaji Harjo, we see the invocation of a Mississippian era kin space time envelope. So their way of being combines both space and places in a dialectical and processual, processual interchange, activating the unrealized possibilities of their ancestors. So Hadogaji's work illustrates this embodied kin space time envelope. Hadogaji is queer, non binary, and an interdisciplinary artist. They apply ancestral knowledges and practices in their artwork. And so, if we look at these stylized sort of markings on their face, they also work in um, resurging traditional tattooing in. Um, Muscogee community or Muscogee cultures. So this is called Mississippian Black Metal Girl on a Friday night. So again, if we look at the stylized facial and finger markings, these are Mississippian ancestors living a futurity through this kind of like embodied map of Mississippian Black Metal Girl on a Friday night. So the eye markings are akin to like some of the warrior markings that you see in older um, like archaeological pieces and art pieces. The face markings, you can interpret them in different ways. They could be family markings. They could also be markings of um, like water or rivers. You have this community knowledge icon iconography right here and finger markings here, but it's also in a contemporary moment. Um, so it's really activating this idea of ancestral roots. And this is an idea of embodied kin space time. So this is their IG right here. If you want to support them, it's at Donna Vera. And then something that recently came up. So Angelina Jolie has um, appropriated kind of these markings which are kin space time envelopes and this just came out i think yesterday or the day before this artist has co-opted black and indigenous kin space time envelopes so you see here where hadogaji is actually um, a metalsmith as well and created these adornment pieces for indigenous folks that want to that don't want to like don't want can't have the permanence of the tattoo markings, but still want to carry the adornment. So they've been working on these different pieces as a metalsmith. And then this recently came out. So you can see like, this is white women wearing indigenous markings. So I mean, that's something that we can have a conversation about afterwards as well. And just to go through some of the geography. So I've got concrete, ephemeral, metaphysical and uh, virtual. So I'm gonna march through those really quick. So in terms of a concrete geography, these are for Muscogee people, these are places that it's like brick and mortar, it's rooted, it's tangible. So this is our, these are our council chambers. It's also a mound building. So you go in, you go in and you're going underground. And this is where our legislative body meets. It's also styled after Earth Lodge at Altmoggy National Monument. Then in terms of our ephemeral geographies, this is a stomp dance and they're actually at our Creek Festival. So we have ceremonial dances, which those are happen at concrete places. Then we have these social dances that are kind of like this ephemeral geography. They're also in the shape of a spiral. So that's another example. Then metaphysical, this is Orion's belt. So it could be thinking about the celestial realm, or you can also talk about the spiritual realm. I mean, I won't talk too much about that because I think that there are things community doesn't want me talking openly about, but that we have to, um, we have to understand that there is an everyday kind of spiritual realm that we grapple with as Muscogee people and that that has to factor in 
to how we plan our communities, how we grow our communities, where we build things. You want to build things where maybe there's a known spiritual entity to reside in that area. And then virtual geography. So uh, this is actually Beth LaPonce's work that Indian Land Tenure Foundation funded and it's when rivers were trails. So it really invokes um, Anishinaabe values in that. Red Stick Warriors, they're teaching language, Muscogee language online. And then you've got some drone footage. So if you can just kind of wrap your head around that idea of virtual geography as a way where community happens. And then finally, I'm just gonna go through some pictures here of how we practice that futurity. So in terms of like these relationships are happening within different spaces, they're happening with kin, with human kin and more than human kin. So here's Indigenous Comic Con in Albuquerque. That's like a huge gathering. That's something they've also had to move online. Here's kind of a gender aware environmental chalk bombing by indigenous students. This is, uh, these are hand games in Tulsa. We have two Indian clubs in the city of Tulsa and they're having kind of like a friendly hand game tournament. This is Rita Williams. So her and her late husband sitting there in the back, they're both Muscogee. They spearheaded a Muscogee Food Sovereignty Initiative. It also shows up in ways of like sports tournaments. This is actually at Creek Nation. This is our Omniplex area. So this is a concrete geography. This could probably be ephemeral because you have softball tournaments happening everywhere all the time. The same thing with intertribal powwows. So they've been having um, powwows there for like over 60 years in Tulsa. Wild Onion Dinners, that's another site of convening and dialogue and knowledge sharing. And this is like, spring is wild onion season. This is um, an elders basketball game. So like everybody's in on like these tournaments, everybody from kids to elders. And then finally I'll end with, um, when I was in Albuquerque, there was some trauma that a couple or like three of our indigenous young women suffered at one of the high schools and one of them got her braid cut. And my class worked with the local school, Native American uh, Community Academy and the students there, they created medicine to address maybe some of the things that the girls were grappling with. So where the school board wasn't recognizing them, their local urban community was and doing their own form of caretaking. So I will end it there and Mado, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I do uh, you know, want to, to explicitly uh, apologize for my uh, ignorance and uh, having butchered uh, the Muscogee uh, name. I, I knew I was going to do some very fine uh, at, at some point, uh, but let's let's now continue with uh, Candice. Hi. Wonderful. Aloha. Aloha my kako. So nice to see all of you. Um, I'm really happy to be here on this wonderful panel. And um, just let me know if you can't hear me at any point. I'm trying to work with multiple media over here. <laughs> okay, so um, I wanted to thank uh, Katie, Salim, Tyler uh, for working so hard on this conference and for bringing us all together for these conversations. I'm speaking to you from Kanaka Maoli lands in Heia Uli on the island of Oahu, where Kanaka Maoli continue to stand for political independence from US occupation and settler colonialism. So I speak as a fourth generation Japanese settler Aloha Aina, a settler who has been raised by the Kaniko'o rain, the Mololani wind, the stream of Heia Uli and the sea of Kavaha o Kamano, um, under the shelter of the mountain Kiahiakahoi. So these are all my places um, in Heia Uli. And I stand uh, on the front lines for lands and waters for Kanaka Maoli and for Kanaka Maoli political independence. So I'm just gonna start my um, 
I'll share screen my PowerPoint with you. As we bear witness to the wastelanding of the earth by late liberal capital, now taking the form of melting glaciers, rising seas, acidification of the ocean, extended droughts, pulse flood events, the extinction of species, indigenous peoples have been working to green the earth once more. As I have argued in my book, Mapping Abundance for a Planetary Future, Kanaka Maoli and Critical Settler Cartographies in Hawaii, Mapping abundance is a radical act in the face of settler capital's fear of abundance, an abundance that feeds. Cartographies of capital produce both illusions of scarcity as well as the materiality of scarcity itself. If such cartographies of capital are drivers of the wastelanding of the earth, under the conditions of global climate change, then I argue that mapping abundance strikes at capital where it is most vulnerable by making visible the abundance of indigenous economies uh, by mapping that abundance. Mapping abundance is an act of radical refusal of capitalist economies. So more specifically, one of the guiding Kanaka Maoli uh, print cartographic principles is a recognition of the elements. So um, in Olelo Hawaii, the term um, people use is akua, which is popularly translated as God, but it really is a reference to the elemental forms and natural processes. And um, I'm going to explain that a little bit more. Kanaka Maoli cartographies in Hawaii are rooted in land-based governance and arrangements of life premised on the laws of the elements that supersede the profit-driven motives of the laws of humans. In this way, Kanaka Maoli are returning to ancestral mapping of the elements to engage more intimately with climate change events and to turn seemingly catastrophic events into possibilities for greater abundance. So as Kanaka Maoli scientists have urged, we need to learn the names of the elements. So I'm gonna just... Okay, so this is um, this is a really beautiful passage from uh, Noelani Punivai, who's talking about learning the names of the elements of our places if we are to survive, adapt to, and transform the effects of global climate change. So um, Hawaiian Studies and Environmental Sciences professor Noelani Punivai explains, if you know your akua, if you are pili to your akua, if you have aloha for your akua and understand their functions, you will know how to work with them and how to respond to them. We too must change. We have to adapt to the elements. The first adaptation is that we know we must know who the akua are. The akua are different on each island and we have to know the akua of our places. When we know our akua, we can call their names and activate them and ourselves. So this is really about activating the elements uh, through a, re a reciprocal form of re recognition. So um, Kanaka Maoli have mapped ancestral knowledges through naming 400,000 akua, meaning that there are very, very many of them each um, naming an elemental form or a natural process. So the deity Laka, who is the deity of Hula, is the natural process of evapotranspiration. And this is from the Edith Kanaka Ole uh, Foundation. Um, they have three houses of knowledge called uh, that engage in the, the methodology of Papaku Makavalu, which is, you know, they sift through um, mele and oli chants and songs for um, ike kupuna or ancestral knowledge that is encoded um, in these oral traditions and they're they're um, identifying these natural processes according to these names that are given to them so um, for example uh, one of my favorite examples is hina lua ikoa hina who vomits or brings forth coral from within and it's the natural process of coral spawning. And her partner, Kukiapua, is the rising motion of the coral gametes. Um, so Kanaka Maoli uh, mapped ancestral knowledges by naming 
winds, rains, cloud formations, ocean currents, and waterways, each with their own elemental functions specific to hundreds of ahupua'a, land divisions that generally extend from the mountains to the sea, um, each embodying the natural processes of growth, decay, and regeneration. And it was shaped this way because um, family who lived in the mountains could then trade with family members who lived near the ocean, and they could have a more varied diet in terms of producing um, different kinds of foods. So the kanavaya keakua is the term for the laws of the elements, and they've been identified through the art of kilo, which is keen intergenerational observation and forecasting of these elemental forms and their relationships with each other. And I have here the term for relationships uh, in Olala Hawaii is pilina, the relationships or connectedness. And so as we establish or you know, articulate and experience these relationships with the elements, um, we're growing that pilina, that sense of that intimacy. And rather than seeing climate change as apocalyptic, we can see the ways that climate change is actually bringing about the demise of capital, making way for indigenous life ways that center familial relationships with the earth and with the elements. Um, so Kanakamali are restoring these worlds where their attunement to clim uh, climatic change and their capacity for kilo adaptation, regeneration and transformation will enable them to survive what capital cannot. And this is through the restoration of fish ponds and lo'ikalo, taro pond fields, the restoration of waterways, um, all of these things very important um, to the resurgence of uh, Kanakamali. So in this way, Kanakamali at um, Kaua Ula, it is the, this is the example I'm going to focus on a little later in the talk. This is the new part, um, book two <laughs> on elemental cartographies. Um, and I want to talk about how they are remapping lands, replacing grids of settler colonial tax map keys. Uh, that's what we call them in Hawaii. I think on the continent, they're more like tax assessment um, maps. Uh, with the elemental, they're challenging these, um, this colonial form of mapping with 1848 Land Commission Award and Royal Patent Grant mapping under the Kingdom of Hawaii. Um, and this is a kind of radical resurgence of elemental cartographies that has enabled um, Kanakamali to adapt to these changes. So much of my thinking about elemental cartographies grows out of the work done by the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation to teach us about these different um, houses of knowledge. And just quickly, I wanted to mention that they identify 22 horizontal realms of island stewardship, um, as well as the laws that protect these realms. And for this talk, I wanted to focus particularly on the Ho'okiki Kanawai, or the Edict of Continuum. So this means that forces of nature should be allowed to flow. So that means the flow of water, the flow of lava, um, the flow of uh, wind currents and um, ocean currents and all of these things are now being jeopardized by development projects that are trying to find alternative energy sources but not in ways that are in consultation with Kanakamali communities. I think that that's the key thing that's missing is pre-informed um, uh, consent. Yeah. Uh, so anyway the Ho'okiki Kanawai is the one that I'm going to be focusing on, and they um, ensure that natural processes unfold as they should. So this helps us to understand, for example, that elements have relationships with each other, so that fresh water has a relationship with ocean water. So the deity of fresh water is Kane, the fresh waters that flow underground, and Kanaloa is the deep consciousness of the ocean. Now their relationship is very uh, important. There, there are a lot of mo'olelo about, uh, these are storied histories about their relationships with e their relationship with each other as they walk the land and they find freshwater springs. And um, the relationship is such that um, uh, you know, in the middle of the Pacific, Hawaii is often a target for these hurricanes that come barreling across the Pacific. But the cold freshwater flows of Kane create a cold water barrier around the islands. So hurricanes 
most often veer north or south once they hit the cold waters around the islands. So that's how we understand the importance of the relationship between Kane and Kanaloa. Um, and so um, the diversion of stream waters, um, by contrast, is really uh, problematic because um, water is not allowed to flow out to the oceans. Um, there's not that continuity to create the estuaries for the baby fish, um, and that there's not that cold water that's creating that protective barrier around the islands. So the community um, is uh, trying to point to the ways that racial capitalist settler state um, laws violate these laws of the elements and even clean energy initiatives um, become exploitative because what they do is they cite um, the wind farms much too close uh, much um, too too closely to schools and residences you know blade throw for a wind farm is 1500 feet and there's currently one that's only like 1300 feet from the nearest school so I'm going to be sharing some of the mapping work that I've done in my book, Mapping Abundance, just to form some common ground for us to work with. And then I'll be turning to some new work on trying to overturn this tax, tax map key regime of mapping under the occupying or settler state um, through these 1848 land commission awards and thousands of chants that map out um, the land and the elements that inform the land. And these are actually interestingly really now becoming a part of a more um, uh, sort of inter or trans indigenous effort in the land back movement. So I'm thinking about the Indian collectives land back movement that um, people at Kaua'ula are actually working um, in consultation with. So I'm gonna start with, a, a, this is an example of a pre-colonial um, oral tradition that was recorded um, in the newspaper. So it's a much older oral tradition. And this is a mo'olelo about the mo'o or reptilian water deities who move between their kinolau or bodily forms as humans uh, and as enormous 30 foot lizards. Mo'o represent the elemental guardians of bodies of water that extend throughout Hawaii. So they are the earliest water protectors. And the Mo'olelo of Kiao Mele Mele, translated as the golden cloud, is an older oral tradition that was recorded by Mokemanu in the Hawaiian language newspapers in 1884. Mo'oinanea, the matriarch of Mo'o deities, gathers her family of Mo'o. Uh, and it's just an amazing story, just when you try to envision um, the action in the story. They arrive in the Ehukai o Pua'ena, the misty sea spray of the surf at the jagged lava cape in Waialua, and they make their way through the dark waters of the long and narrow Uko'a fish pond where the Aka'akai uh, bulrushes and uki sedge stir with plentiful fish. Then they proceed across the wind-blown plains of Lauhulu, perhaps to the Kaukonahua stream and from there to Kapu Kaki. So I'm gonna read this Mo'olelo in Olelo Hawaii because the vibration of your voice is a kind of ho'okupu or an offering um, and it's key to the restoration of abundance uh, as the elements listen for this kind of recognition. Ua hiki moa mai o ya mapua ena waialua Aya malaila kono wahi i ho'onoho pono ai i kana hua ka inui o ya ho'i ka hua ka iona mo'o. Aya makikula o lau hulu ma waialua ua pani pa'aloa ia ya wahi e na mo'o. O ka hiki mua ana keia o na mo'o kupua maki ia pai aina ma muli no ia o ka make make o ka mo'o ina nea a pe nei e maupopo ai ka nui o na mo'o. Ua ho'onoho pālua ia ka hele ana o ka huakai, o ka makamua o nā mo'o, aia i ka piina o ka puka ki, ai o ka hope no ho'i aia no i lauhulu, a mawaina mai o ki ia wahi mai waialua a ewa, ua pani pa'aloa ia e nā mo'o. So Mo'oina mo Nea arrived first at Pua'ena in Waialua. There she arranged her great company of lizards. The plain of Lauhulu in Waialua was covered with them. This was the first time that the supernatural lizards arrived on these islands. It was through the will of Mo'oina Nea. This is how we know the number of lizards. She set them two by two in the procession. 
when the first of the lizards reached the incline of Kapuka Ki, Red Hill, the last ones were still in Lohulu, and between those two places from Waialua to Eva, the places were covered with lizards. So from these words, we can imagine the stately procession of Mo'o, their great tail sweeping from side to side, flickering between their reptilian forms as enormous lizards and their human forms as fierce men and women making their way across the plains with the Ko'olau mountains misted with rain to their left and the, and the cloud covered summit of Ka'ala in the Waianae mountains to their right. So um, what I've done is I um, take the oral mapping of the Mo'olelo and tracked it along a ge geological map. Um, the geological map is helpful because it shows us the erosional unconformity that is the geological scene between the Waianae volcanic series, which is here, and the Ko'olau volcanic series, which is all this green area here. So this is the seam of that um, erosional unconformity. And the dip in the land is where the waters from the two mountain ranges meet in the Kaukonahua stream. So um, what does this Mo'olelo teach us? This Mo'olelo is a mapping of water. The Mo'olelo maps the hydrological cycle as it unfolds along the backbone of the continuous line of Mo'o. The Mo'o arrive in the sea spray of Pua'ena, where salt particulates see clouds that sweep along past the fish ponds, watering the plains of Waialua, where the waters of the two mountain ranges meet. This mapping of the migration of the mo'o may have taken place at a time when the kupuna, the grandparents or the ancestors, saw cascading changes in the natural world, perhaps an intensification of heat, a lessening of rainfall, shifts in the migration patterns of the anai, the mullet, in the health of the limu, the seaweeds, in the numbers of the o'oku or gobi fish who propel their way up waterfalls hundreds of feet high. Uh, one thing is certain, the arrival of the Mo'o signals a historical event when Kanaka Maoli began to pay greater attention and care to the care and conservation of water and the cultivation of fish. The Mo'o became known as the guardians who enforced conservation kanavai, or the laws, to protect springs, streams, and fish ponds, ensuring that water was never taken for granted. So we can take this image and you know, it's not just a story, it's a history. And so we can take this, this historic image of the procession of the reptilian water deities extending along those plains as a visual representation of Mo'o Aina, which is the name of smaller land divisions connected by the flows of fresh water. So you have the larger um, Ahupua'a land divisions that extend from the mountains to the seas, and then within them are embedded these smaller interlinked mo'o aina. Um, and uh, this procession of mo'o is very important because it emerges as a Kanaka Maoli cartographic principle of life it reminds us that distant places on land are connected by vast networks of surface and subterranean waterways. And it refutes the ways that cartographies of capital enclose and fragment lands from one another. Um, so, you know, in the diversion of water or um, other development projects that attempt to isolate places on the land from each other through such uh, settler colonial practices as quote unquote phased archaeological inventory surveys, which means that before um, a development, you know, the development pro project uh, is being conducted, I mean, sorry, the construction is being conducted at the same time as these archaeological inventory surveys are being done. And what this means is if they come across an important or um, a very sacred find, um, they often bulldoze over them saying that they've spent too much money in the project to withdraw. Okay, so um, it's uh, very difficult to stop projects um, when you have these kinds of settler colonial laws in place. Um, and so I want to kind of look a little bit more at this Mo'o Aina. And this is also another really, it's actually a really beautiful map 
um, it's a textual map, but it evokes um, the knowledge that people who lived in the area would have had. So um, this is a, a map. Um, so the word mo'o refers both to reptilian water deities and to the idea of a series. So when I say mo'olelo as storied history, the word mo'o means a series of talk. Um, the word mo'oku auho means genealogy and it means a series of generations. And so mo'o aina would be a series of land that stretch across the land. So when we think about the pairs of mo'o lining up in the procession, they stretch across the land like the mo'o aina land divisions connected by the ivikua mo'o or the backbone of the coursing streams fed by the rains of each place they pass through. And there are thousands of rain names um, as Colette Lemomi Akana and Kiele um, Gonzalez carefully document. Um, Oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, the carefully document um, each rain distinct in color, um, intensity, duration, path, sound, scent, meaning, and effect. The clouds from which the rains fell were also carefully categorized into 37 distinct cloud formations and 405 subcategories of these clouds. So when we look at this, what this is, is Land Commission 3131. Um, this was given to the claimant Kuapu'u in 1851 by the Land Commission. It illustrates the principle of Pilina. And I'm gonna go into detail in, so there are three parts to this land claim. There's Apana 1, Apana 2, and Apana 3, meaning section 1, 2, and 3. And I'm gonna focus primarily on Apana 2 which is a mulivai. So a mulivai is the meeting of the fresh and the salt water, the brackish water, and it's the mulivai of Ulehava, which evokes for us the story of Maui. Ulehava is the place of the uh, Kupua's, Kupua Maui's birth. And the Kupua Maui brought many gifts to Kanaka Maui, uh, including gifts of fire, um, longer days, he slowed the sun's path across the sky. So all of this is evoked by the reference to Ulehava. People know, oh, this is near Pu'uheleakala, where Maui uh, slowed the sun's progression across the sky. So it's um, also bounded, um, and in a way to keep in mind that in this particular map, Borders are not boundaries of separation, but seams of relationality. They are the seams of Pilina. So um, the, it, this, part, part, this particular uh, mo'oaina is bordered mauka or inland by the Pali um, Kavakea. Uh, and on the Eva side, which is uh, on the sort of a west end by the Iliaina Kaolai. Um, Makai by the, so uh, let's say, so uh, I'm sorry, Makai, the public road, Makai meaning ocean word, and YW stands not for east and west, but Waialua, which is a, a location in the on the western end of the island um, by the Pali Pu'ohulu, uh, Pu'ohulu, uh, Pu'ohulu, um, I'm sorry, Pu'ohulu. So this is the cliff of Pu'ohulu. And so we can see how um, this, uh, this particular apana or section was identified by these other natural formations. And it's key in mapping Kanaka Maoli who have uh, a familial relationship with these forms. So the Kumulipo is the cosmogonic chant that is one of many, but it, it's a koihonua that describes the creation of the world and the um, the intimate connection between um, Kanaka Maoli and the, um, the elements, um, the, the sea. And uh, this is what uh, Kekuhi uh, Kanaka, uh, Kealii Kanaka Oleo Haililani calls it. She talks about the fish people. It's about um, the fish people, the, uh, the earth people, the mineral people, the uh, ocean people, um, that they are all connected. Okay, so um, I'm going to slide now to talking about 
this is the, one of the images that I submitted for the installation. And so it's a more contemporary illustration of Kanakamali mapping of the elements as well as community struggles to protect lands and waters. So uh, Kiala Aloha, I'm sorry, Miala Aloha Bishop's painting, Kalopa'a o Waiahole, uh, which means the hard taro of Waiahole, referring both to the taro and to the steadfast people mapping the layered history of kalo farming from the collective struggles of farmers against eviction by wealthy landowners to the fight to restore waters to streams that were diverted to feed the sugarcane on plantations. So the painting maps Ahupua'a. Um, so I'm going to show you a detail of the map. Um, so it shows you the mapping of Ahupua'a. Again, these are land divisions stretching from the mountains out to the seas um, and um, to the outer ridge, actually, of the reef in this kind of this beautiful layered palette of translucent greens that captures the effect of sunlight filtering through the fine mesh of capillaries and leaves, the land and the kalo vibrate with life. And the veins of the kalo leaves are the arterial streams that feed the valleys. And we see the names of the ahupua'a mapped on the leaves. A reclamation of place names many had forgotten along with the mo'olalo um, that were specific to them. So Bishop, the artist, explains that the impact of lost ahupua'a place names, um, it had an impact on her own life. She explains, quote, I have lived in Ka'alaea most of my life. The thing is, I never knew I lived in Ka'alaea. I thought it was Kahalu'u. Now we have signs that tell us what the land divisions are, but in the old days, it was just Kahalu'u. So you can see how these smaller areas would get buried under larger land divisions. Um, so there's a layering of history here. And, you know, so these are uh, examples of Ahupua'a. So this would be like, you know, I'm going to be talking about Lahaina. And this is like, these are the Ahupua'a. And there's actually many, many more. But this artist um, who created this um, map in 1838, Samuel P. Kalama, um, he was restrained by space. So there are, you know, actually um, dozens of Ahupua'a that don't appear on this particular map. But the mapping was done in order to protect lands um, from encroachment um, to establish that the, Hawaii, um, the Hawaiian kingdom had its own inventory of lands um, that could not be arbitrarily seized by other nations or other powers. Um, but you can see how here, um, you can see how that inspired um, Miala's uh, uh, painting of the leaves of the kalo. Um, and so in the quorum of the root are these newspaper images. Oh, Alberto, can you let me know when my time is up? Is my time up? I'm at 30 minutes. Pretty much. It oh, I am. But if you can wrap up, that would be okay. great. Okay, okay. So, questions in. Okay, I... Okay, so I have three more pages, so I'll go really quickly. So these are the land struggles. So you can see how she's memorializing and remembering the land struggles in the quorum. And this is uh, Kaua'ula, um, where the women um, were protecting ancestral remains, and they were all five of them were arrested for protecting ancestral remains when they were unearthed by um, the developer who was trying to put in these diversion pipelines to divert water from the Kaua'ula stream. So here is um, an example of how um, Kaua'ula is linked to the land back movement. They're refuting the, um, the tax map keys. And uh, this is what a tax map key looks like. This land uh, is reduced to this particular number, 4060. Two one zero one six zero 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 zero, and you know it's it's a meaningless abstraction of the land. And here is actually what an LCA award looks like. So you see all the family names are here, which is a reinsertion of the genealogy of the people back to the land. Okay, and this is what the commission land commission award looks like. And um, the process of making kapa has also become part of the struggle to protect Kaua'ula. So we make this bark cloth uh, and my kumu, uh, Aia Ibello made this particular, uh, it's actually a scarf and it's printed with um, an imprint of um, a 
stamp she made of the Kaua'ula wind. The wind of Kaua'ula is very powerful and it sweeps across the whole Aupua'a. And so this is the wind that travels over many mountains before it hits the ocean. Okay, and I'm just kind of going to go. Uh, the last image, this is in the exhibit. Um, and this is about um, the images showing the succession of inundation of Waikiki because of rising tides. Uh, we have king tides now and I even have images of hotels in Waikiki where their lobbies and the parking structures were flooded from these rising tides. But according to um, the artist, uh, Kaili Chan, she says this is about the restoration of abundance, about the return of Kanaloa. And that's a term from um, Kanaka Maoli uh, microbiologist um, Rosie Alegado, who talks about the return of sea level rise as the return of Kanaloa. And the question is, how will we greet him? So I'm going to end there. And then if you have questions, I can talk more about these different things. Thank, Thank you, you so I'm much. I'm going to stop sharing. No, okay. this, this, this has been incredible. Um, I, I, I do want to say that it strikes me uh, the contrast of how much you were willing to be hermeneutic with us and teach us and show us how to read uh, things that Laura instead kind of turned into you know, these are, these are esoteric and there are knowledges coded in here that I don't necessarily want everyone to know. So that was a very interesting contrast. Um, I do want to mention Tristan Landry asked a question about whether, where he can see the cover of your book and we posted uh, McCoy's uh, webpage in, in the chat. So I, I think that question should be hopefully taken care of. Uh, we do have to finish on time, um, so I will only probably read this long question from uh, Lara Alana Jacobs, because it's really a series of questions. Um, this is a question for Laura Harjo. Uh, she starts by greeting and introducing herself. Uh, I, 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 you know, I won't even dare to try to read. Uh, but, I, but she does say, uh, I'm curious about the time space envelopes and activating the possibilities of our ancestors. Do you think that reimagining these things may open the door to cultural exchanges as well? Or do you think it is possible to activate the possibilities of our ancestors in ways that do not reimagine traditions? Um, and then she follows up on this with what protections are there for the tradition and the ceremony when thinking in temporal futurities? And who should be thinking in these ways? If I can just add to this, I mean, this is a question for Nachi as well. Could I be rowing in the canoes or a Seattler be doing it without, you know, a form of cultural appropriation? Or could uh, in Candice's presentation, can we see this um, kind of, I don't know if it's a reinvented identities who become a part of the uh, original peoples as we as we think of this recovery. So I, I, I don't know if it's a huge question, but I'm actually asking it to Laura first, but then if Candice and, and, and Nachi can give us their insight, that would be wonderful. Laura. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Mado, Laura, for that question too. So just to say really quickly in terms of kin space time envelopes and how how things can be reimagined for cultural changes. I actually have several examples. And at the very first page of my book, I talk about it, that my grandfather is teaching me a pawn shop song. We didn't have pawn shop songs like 500 years ago. So that's like the first sort of renegotiation. Anytime there's any kind of change in technology, there's going to be a renegotiation of culture and tradition. So, um, the pawn shop in itself, that's a new form of, of a different economic system. Um, our dances are pretty much always on the weekend, right? And is that, did we always have them on Saturday, Saturday nights? Or did that respond to the wage economy that people have to work Monday through Friday? So that's another example in terms of, um, yeah, like jewelry. I think of Kenneth Johnson's work and his paddle necklaces and his turtle bracelet and how that kind of tells of stomp dance. And we didn't have those same technologies before removal maybe, 
With tattoos, that's also renegotiated knowledge and it's triangulated with Mississippian art forms. So I absolutely do see like these reimaginings of our traditions in terms of activating and not reimagining our traditions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure because part of it is guided by your values. So like, it doesn't necessarily have to be like tradition the way we think of like language and dances, but you can think about reimagining or activating our relatives possibilities and the values we've always carried around reciprocity, generosity, uh, caretaking of other kin and more than human kin. Um, and then in terms of protections for tradition and ceremony and thinking in temporal futurities, um, yeah, I think in terms of that, I would say first, like what, what are you protecting it from? Are you protecting it from like people forgetting it or not practicing it or it being co-opted? Um, like either one of those, like I think everybody should have, everybody in the Muscogee community or a indigenous community should have some kind of role. The other aspect of that that gets kind of dangerous of when we start like naming who is going to protect what, what aspect of that is gendered. And it's like, when I say that, I mean, are our narratives about our people, are, are they telling about male heroes? Are they erasing women? Are they erasing women's roles? Are they erasing two-spirit queer trans folks so like it's there has to be a reimagining that maybe doesn't look at traditions if it subjugates anybody in the community especially if we're going to be about anogechka and raising everybody's boat so thank you for the question well, thank you laura uh, nachi do you have like a couple of comments or two minutes at most or one minute <laughs> and then we turn it to candice Yeah, it's a hard one. I mean, I'm not, I think each community makes their choices around some of these things. And that's kind of what that inherent sovereignty is about, right? The ability to make those negotiations and make the decisions that, that folks have to make. And they're going to be different. And they always have done it. You know, this is this is nothing new, actually. It's just that the constraints of settler colonialism has different consequences to those choices and limitations. And that's what makes the, that question much harder because there's an external force trying to, you know, damage and punish those choices. And so I think that's the context. And I think that's why that question even becomes a question, so. Yeah, um, think that, that's such a great question too. Uh, I, I'm thinking, I really liked um, what Laura was talking about in terms of, yeah, activating these possibilities because, um, so whatever I do is um, there's kapu knowledge that's forbidden and there's no knowledge that's free. So what I take is from the newspapers. Uh, what I do is always in consultation with the communities that I work with. So um, like the Kawa Ula folks, I um, interviewed uh, Ki Aomoku and he, he wants us to get the word out because he wants you know other families to know they can claim their Kuleana awards and he's making a blueprint for them to, to come forward. So because um, the right now a lot of the practitioners are holding stewardship classes so that those of us who are not kanaka can learn stewardship practices and part of it has to do with learning the chants and the chants are a way to engage in a vibration that will vibrate with the um, kupuna vibration that's what one of the practitioners in my book talks about that kupuna vi vibration is what we strive for because once you hit that it enables it moves action Aloha moves action, that vibration moves action. It creates abundance. We chant for, when we chant, we imagine thousands of ohia seeds sprouting up from the earth. You know, that's part of the chant. And you imagine that you direct it towards the ku'ahu, the altar, and that imagery and the chant, the vibration in your voice is to help connect with that um, energy. Thank you so much. This is a perfect place, I think, to stop for the day. Um, I, I do want to say to everyone in the audience uh, that there is the curated uh, exhibit online, so you can also find some of the references there. We've tried also to put some of the books uh, from our incredible panelists uh, up there in the chat as well. Uh, and I do want to 
remind us that um, we, we, we still have another set of sessions tomorrow, uh, but I believe Salim will probably give us some instructions uh, for that purpose. But right now, I just want to close this panel by thanking you three for this incredible, incredible uh, sharing of your knowledge uh, to, with all of us and uh, to everyone else who's been here in this community uh, of learning. Uh, I just wish we would be in the map room uh, and we could, you know, touch each other, you know, feel each other more closely. Uh, it will have to wait, but, but we'll get there eventually. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alberto. So Katie is probably going to give us the instructions for tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a, a tag team effort as per normal. Thank you so much to the panel and thank you to Alberto for being a chair again. We do get Alberto for one more panel tomorrow, so don't be disappointed, people. He's coming back. So I would like to thank you very much for joining us again today. We greatly enjoyed both of our panels and our excellent keynote. We're really grateful to our speakers, our moderators, and our translator for their insights and their interventions. We're also grateful to you, our audience, for your curiosity and for your patience. Please do continue the conversations begun here on social media using the hashtag BLRCC3. We will see you all back here tomorrow, starting again at 9 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time for our third and our final keynote from Eric Anderson and Carrie Cornelius, both of the Haskell Indian Nations University. This will be followed by two panels focusing on digital approaches to indigenous mapping. All that is left for me is to say thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your day. And Salim, over to you. Thank you, Katie. Um, I would just like to uh, echo what Katie has said. Uh, I will also want to add my thanks uh, to the today's speakers for the brilliant talks. Uh, another set of um, fantastic and illuminating talks, really, um, the audience for the insightful, insightful questions and to our moderators, uh, Dave, Katie Parker, as well as Alberto will be back tomorrow. Uh, they did such a wonderful job in moderating uh, today's panel. So uh, just quick word about Zoom. Uh, those who registered during the last week appear to not be getting their Zoom links. Uh, we have reported the issue to Zoom and they're working to resolve it. Meanwhile, those registrants will receive a link an hour before the conference begins tomorrow, which will be just after 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time. Um, lots of you couldn't make it to all of the conference uh, thus far, uh, and perhaps some parts of tomorrow. Uh, we do plan on releasing recordings of all the talks from the conference by early December. Uh, to, all, to all of those who attended, who registered, we will, uh, we will announce it in the Rumsey uh, newsletter and we will then also post it at, uh, on our uh, YouTube channel. Um, i like to lastly mention, I know Alberto, you did it as well, uh, uh, the, the digital exhibition. It includes uh, several of the maps and objects uh, from most of our speakers today. So please visit, um, it'll, it'll be there. Uh, um, online exhibits.stanford.edu slash blrcc3. And I guess with that, I look forward to welcome, welcoming all of you tomorrow at the same time, 9 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time or PDT for our final day of the conference. So from all of us here on the conference team, have a wonderful day or night, depending on where you are, and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.